Welcome to One More Best Pret Spotlight by Build Up California. Best Pret Spotlight series showcase examples of what works well in expanding, improving, and sustaining child care facilities in our communities. By increasing the quality of our child care facilities, we provide um, great environments for children, staff, and families ones that foster relationships, nurture development, promote health and wellness, and facilitate learning. When planning for childcare space improvement, it can be overwhelming to know where to start and what to pursue. So in this webinar, we will discuss how to identify improvements needed in your center-based facility and hear about best practice solutions from experts in the field. This uh, webinar, we will have another edition uh, focus on home-based um, facilities that will be held uh, some days from now on Saturday, and then we will have a recording also for uh, both sessions on our um, website. So my name is Erica Erickson. I am the Policy and Program Officer for Early Care and Education at the Low Income Investment Fund. In this role, I have the honor to coordinate the development of Build Up California, a statewide network of early learning facilities champion launched in 2020. And uh, if you want more information, we will put the link on the chat for our website, but it's buildupcalifornia.org, buildupca.org. So before we introduce our team of experts here today, I want to share some information about logistics. This event is being hosted in English with simultaneous translation to Spanish by Felipe. Thank you, Felipe. Gracias. So, uh, si, que, si necesita de traducción en español, clica en lo Globo Terráqueo uh, 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 en tu pantalla para escuchar Felipe en español. So, this event is also being hosted in a webinar mode, and by now we are all experts on Zoom, right? Um, and Basically, everybody's on mute, all participants, but please use the chat to share your comments and use the Q&A function to ask your questions. We are going to have a, a dialogue first uh, among the speakers, and then uh, we will open for questions and answers. Uh, we will have questions and answers at the end. So let me introduce here our team today, and uh, their bios will be shared in the chat, and, but, so I'm going to only share their names and their organizations. First, we, it's an honor to have with us Louis Torelli with Space for Children. Uh, we also have here Kathy Tama, consultant for ECE, uh, for Early Care, uh, Learning and Care, uh, specializing in facilities. Heather Clearly, um, is with, she is, she's the Chief Executive Officer at Peninsula Family Service. Eileen Monahan, she's a consultant also for early care and education, specializing facilities. And then we have Pamela Campos, Policy and Program Associate for Early Learning and Care at the Low Income Investment Fund. So we will start with a dialogue um, in presentations by Louis Torelli, Kathy, and Heather. And they will be having, we will have a conversation about um, improvements, facilities improvement in center based um, childcare facilities. And then we will open around one o'clock, we will open um, for questions and answers when um, Pamela and Eileen will be bringing the questions that you share in the QA and the chat and Facebook. We have Facebook Live. Um, we will be sharing these questions during the Q&A uh, portion of the event. And with no further ado, I will pass to Heather. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Erica. I run a large state subsidized program at Peninsula Family Service, and we have been waiting a long time for a fund like this. And I'm going through the application myself, and I do have some questions about what I'm going to apply for. One of the reasons I'm so glad to be here today with Kathy and Lewis, two early learning facility experts. And I know that good design matters. It facilitates the implementation of high quality curriculum, makes transitions easier, and can improve the confidence of our teachers who work so hard each day to support and educate our youngest learners. 
I'll be asking Kathy and Lois questions throughout their presentation and hope to walk away with some specific ideas about what my centers need and what should fit the guidelines of the grant. But let's start with best practices. Kathy and Lois, can you share some facility best practices with us? Okay, thank you. I'm gonna put the screen on for the start the PowerPoint. Uh, hold on. All right, everybody see that? Yep. Okay, let's start. So uh, in the presentation, uh, Kathy and I are gonna go over this key components of quality as it relates to the physical environment. Uh, we'll be covering things like a lot like, you know, plumbing, sinks and toilets and air quality and lighting and uh, the acoustics in the classroom and storage and um, also a section on play yards and how to create an indoor outdoor environment. So basically, uh, simply stated, like why is the environment important? It's important because it impacts how children learn and how teachers teach. I learned this uh, early on when I started in my uh, career as an early childhood educator, spending six years in the classroom and trying to deal with uh, compromised environments and how it compromised my work uh, as well. But to recognize that the physical environment impacts the emotional environment, it impacts relationships, and that's really the core of the curriculum uh, for an early childhood. Um, security, control, uh, physical health, we're spending more time thinking about this uh, now and the, the, particularly in the last two years, but how the environment supports uh, children's and the staff's physical health and safety, and also how it impacts uh, social relationships between uh, children, between peers, but also between uh, teachers and children, and how uh, a well-designed environment minimizes the management behavior and supports more self-initiated learning. Okay, and then we'll also talk a bit about program practices. And, I think, Kathy, uh, you have the next slide. Kathy? Okay, microphone challenge. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the headset, you know, there yeah. you go. <laughs> All right. Okay, but, um, you know, just to go back to what kind of Heather was saying, I am very excited to share with you the best practices. Lewis and I could probably teach an entire semester course just on the things we're trying to give to you today in the slideshow. We know it could be overwhelming, but we want you just to take it a step at a time, take notes, and we know it so could be overwhelming, but we want you just to take it a step at a time, take notes, and we know so it could be overwhelming, but we want you just to take it a step at a time, take notes. I'm having a problem and with my mind. Be overwhelming, but we want you just to I think take there's an echo. I'm hearing it too, Kathy. I, I'm, it's I'm a repeating problem, problem with my mind. <laughs> <laughs> but let me go ahead. It's, um, but anyway, it's, um, you know, I'm just going to show you some improvements you may want to consider. Some people may already know all about these, others may not. You may learn something you didn't know about, and we hope you enjoy uh, the photographs and the information and get inspired. So, okay. Heather, when you, when we wanted to start to, to look, it's, um, where do you start? It's sort of like, if we go back to the, the previous slide, it okay. has to do with a checklist. What you want to do is gather information about what it is that you want to do. You already have all your wish lists. Your teachers have been <laughs> talking about it. You probably have lists of scraps of paper with things you want to do. But what, but what can help you in this process? There's going to be in the chat a link to download this checklist. And that could help you guide through different sections of improvement. Okay, next slide, Lewis. 
And then there should be a check a link for this guide. This guide is long, it's 47 pages and it's to refer to. So if you want to think about something to do with acoustics, it can take you to acoustics or lighting, you could go to lighting. Okay, next slide. And what you wind up then doing is once you've educated yourself and you get all your notes together, get your, you know, the significant people together and walk through your center and um, take snapshots of things you're considering and take notes and keep them for later. And that, that would be extremely helpful when you are going to think, hmm, should we do something with this thing? Wonderful, Kathy. This is very helpful. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the nuts and bolts, uh, begin to, to discuss those. So high priority in terms of uh, facility improvements and classroom improvements is uh, sinks. Now, you know, this has been a main big focus in the, the last couple of years with uh, COVID, but it's really been something that has been a best practice for many years. And what I have on the screen is just the uh, the guidance from the, the, the CDC on uh, caring for children in groups and where sinks and, and high, health hygiene should occur. So basically, if you look at this, um, you know, when should the, the t uh, children and staff and families wash hands? First, when they come into the facility, uh, before and after preparing food, eating, administering medication, before and after diapering, using the toilet, coming in contact with bodily fluid, which uh, teachers have do all the time with runny noses uh, constantly with, uh, with children, um, animals, outdoors, uh, using the outdoors, handling garbage. So basically what it's saying, recommending, is that sinks should be uh, available everywhere to make it easy for teachers and children to wash their hands at those uh, periods of time. So again, having sinks and, and thinking about this in terms of um, applying for funds, uh, do you have a sink <clears throat> at your entry be, uh, as children and staff and parents come into the program? Having sinks uh, at the eating table area for both uh, adults and children. This is all adults and children. Uh, in the diapering toileting area, if you have a teacher support area, food prep uh, area in your classroom, and having it outside, critical. So entry sinks, again, these, this is a new facility. It looks very nice. It doesn't have to be fancy, but basically the idea I, prep that you would preferably have a child height sink and an adult height sink at the entry. Can, can I mention Lewis too yeah. on that slide is just to tell people, Lewis and I worked on the center together. It's in Washington, DC. And we designed it in the late 90s. So washing hands in the entrance yeah. was a, good, a best practice back then. This just didn't come in 22 years later or 24 years later. It's always been an issue and a best practice. Yes. Okay. So uh, again, uh, sort of thinking about your cl the classrooms is, do you have uh, where you've set up the eating table activity area, both a child sink and an adult sink? So again, it's going to depend on your space, how big it, uh, um, the uh, counter area is and the sinks and storage. But uh, having a child and adult sink at the eating and table area is, is essential if you're gonna make it uh, manageable and uh, support health practices. Because when the, children, when the children's sink is only in the bathroom, that means there's this constant coming and going. And there's many times that children uh, need to wash their hands, but they don't need to, uh, to toilet. So this is essential. Um, what not to do, and again, I, I work, Throughout the country, I visited. I think about uh, I was in been in about 300 classrooms and uh, 30 uh, facilities just in the last few months. And many, many of the facilities 
have sinks that are not at child height. So they have the step stools set up. Step stools are, it becomes a safety issue. Uh, you know, you're, you're turning, turned around and this toddler gets <laughs> pushed off by another toddler. So this is essential is to have sinks that are child level. And I know Kathy and her list, uh, checklist that she has, she has specifications for uh, specific sinks and heights, right? And even in an infant room. So if you're serving infants, young infants, so let's say you have an infant room that goes up to you know walking or 15 months, there can be a child sink in the room if it's the right height and the right design. Part of the right design is not just the height, but the depth so that they can wash their hands. It doesn't, they don't have to overreach and the, the counter edges are rounded so that a child, a nine month old who's pulling up the standing is, uh, is not gonna hit their chin on a sharp counter uh, surface of the base cabinet. It's all possible. And it makes your life as a teacher so much more easy uh, uh, to manage and physically easier that you don't have to pick up the child uh, to uh, have them wash their hands over the adult height sink. Um, so trough sinks, trough sinks are great. Uh, I think Kathy has more information on them, but really you could use them anywhere from older toddlers up, older toddlers and preschoolers. The benefit is that two children can wash their hands simultaneously. There's both peer learning, it minimizes management, waiting one at a time, um, and it becomes a great social activity. So that uh, uh, example of an eating uh, table area for a preschool classroom with, with uh, a, a base cabinet and, and wall storage, and then adjacent child sink uh, next to the eating area. This is again something that I see and document all over the country and plenty in California, um, where uh, the teachers who are all doing the best <laughs> they can in, in uh, compromised environments, and, uh, and I empathize with them because I had those kinds of situations for six years, where here's an example of a preschool classroom, and you can kind of see uh, the children lined up, waiting to wash their hands one at a time, stepping on the step stool, and then the teacher goes, next, next. It's so exhausting for a teacher to do this every day. They don't realize the impact that it has because most teachers are so easygoing. It's, but changing that experience changes their life as well as the child's life in terms of supporting self-initiated learning, right? Another example you see, and, and I took these at the same time, this is the same um, facility, classroom, children lining up in the bathroom to go uh, on a step stool to wash their hands in the bathroom while another teacher of, in this group of 20 is uh, using the sink on the, in the classroom side, you can also see the child's going onto the step stool and they're very responsible. They're washing their hands, all of those points that are uh, mentioned uh, in the CDC guidance, but that happens seven, eight, nine times a day. And it requires all this managing for, from the teachers. What I'm showing you here is the same uh, bathroom. Uh, the, you can see the uh, children uh, at the table area and there's the bathroom in the corner. This is an old modular building, which there's thousands of them in, the, in early childhood. And then the after, I'm gonna show you the next, on the right side, the next photo. Basically, if you have plumbing available, it's not difficult and not expensive to redo it to be appropriate. And so this next photo you see that is the same space. And what's the difference is going, let me go back from that counter space where the teachers were lining up the children uh, on a step stool to now the children can wash the hands at the same time. So two children can wash their hands inside the bathroom, switching out that sink to a trough sink two children can wash their hands uh, in the classroom side. So four at a time, self-directed, uh, the sense of both com accomplishment, competency, and the teacher, instead of having to manage the group, is just, you know, they know the, the routine. They can wash their hands on their own. As you can see, the child on the far left, he's uh, taking care of himself well, and he feels good about it. 
Uh, also, while I'm on this photo, I want to mention that in terms of supervision, that's also a big issue in, in the classroom. So the bathrooms that you have, you may be able to adjust it. Like in this space here, we opened up, we cut out, did a window cutout. So a teacher in the classroom can still supervise children who are toileting in this in the, the bathroom uh, whilst being in the main part of the room. So uh, active supervision uh, throughout the space in all areas is a key part that you might want to look at in terms of uh, the funding that you are applying for. Another example of where you could take a compromised space and make it much more functional. So the photos on the bottom are of this, oh, excuse me, the photos on the bottom is this bathroom that this uh, toddler classroom had. There it is. And that was inside the bathroom. They had one sink, they had a toilet, they had a diaper changing table. That happened to be in this classroom, the only sink that was available for diapering, uh, for children, for adults, for diapering and for food. So that was high priority. But since there was a plumbing line on this wall, it was not difficult to redo it and take basically as an example, just opening up that uh, window, that door, and just enlarging it to allow for better uh, observation into the classroom. Um, changing out this wall where they had a, a, a cork board to a window. So a teacher who's now diapering can see in. And since this is already a, a, a toilet on that side of, on the bathroom side, uh, the plumbing uh, was available. So you just use that plumbing wall and now have a child sink and an adult sink for the eating and table area. And then this uh, bathroom, this uh, diaper changing table area uh, got cleaned up and organized and uh, it makes it a lot more accessible. So that's, that's an example of a, you know, Real child care center, compromised, old, how to optimize the space. Another example, uh, taking a space, uh, taking a space that uh, had no children's sink or adult sink in the classroom, but they had this teacher workspace. So just changing that and being able to add an adult and child sink. Another example of a diapering area. Uh, with no child's or adult sink inside uh, in the classroom for eating and uh, hand washing. So just using that plumbing wall and the suggestion, this is the example I'm showing, is to just add sinks on this wall since that's already the plumbing wall. If you don't have a sink in your bathroom and you have limited space or there's also issues that may come up because of ADA, there are small sinks that you could a work off of the existing adult sink. These are just examples. Okay, Kathy. Hi, I just had a backyard, my neighbor's backyard, um, uh, our, our leaf blowing. So I hope you don't hear that. I have to close my window. But, you know, I know I get uh, questions all the time on what sinks uh, do you recommend or what sinks do you use? And, I think Lewis does also. And so for the infant and uh, the infant sinks, I, I prefer having um, the ceramic sinks, but that's not necessary. But look to make sure they have round edges, ADA accessible. We also like the, um, the goose neck uh, faucet with the lover handles. And so you could see the child, which is washing their hands here. And one of the things is the whole sink is pushed closest to the leading edge. It's not far back. And so the handles are reachable. And I also, you know, I typically have them set the, the lever handles forward so the kids don't have to reach far back. So you don't get water running down your sleeve and down your shirt. Okay, next one. And for older children, you know, we all love that um, the cast iron uh, Cola Brockway sink. It's it's right there. It's K three two hundred, and um, a one sink we've been 
currently using for uh, centers that want to switch over to the touchless um, faucets is this uh, D E sink. It's large though, it's 27 inches. And it's the only trough sink I could find that meets ADA requirements that will work in center-based programs. And if you're going to go that way, I recommend using the Kohler um, uh, touchless faucet that's down there and that model. And, and that, that faucet comes in 27 models. <laughs> <laughs> so get that one because it's battery operated and you're able to change the mixing level above the deck. And the sensors are low enough for the kids to hit. All right. And there's are always small sinks you can get. Duravet has a whole line of them, and Manmix has some wall mounted ones. Okay, next slide. And for um, adults, it's super important that your adult sinks are six and a half inches. I usually set a minimum of seven before, but because of ADA, the, the deepest you could go is six and a half. If it's any shallower than that, the, you know, you know it, the water comes in and it splashes out onto, you know, the floor, the counter, everywhere, but in the sink. So the other thing, if you're going to go touchless faucets for the adults, which might be the way to go, um, I suggest looking at the Moen, their collection, and that's just because their faucets aren't as high. Uh, the um, Kohler and Delta make them, but the faucets are huge. There's some of them are 20 inches tall, which is awfully tall. And you want them, Louis, can you point to where the sensors are on the faucets? Can you see them? They're just, um, yeah, there's a little black sensor. Yeah, there's one on that one and there's one on the other one. So you don't want the sensors on the top because <laughs> if you have short staff, that's not gonna, they're not gonna reach them. Kathy, are there any disadvantages to the touchless? Um, I don't know. They haven't been in use that long. I The reason I spec these, and I just did this at a center, and they've just been using them for the past, I don't know, five months or so, is that these you can you can have the option because of the lever to do it with your hand also. So it doesn't have to be, you can turn it on and off with the lever. You can make it touchless. I think you can tap it even, and it has the sprayer on it. Nice. Um, and the reason I like you to be able to do it by yourself is because if, if <laughs> somehow um, you don't, you know, but these are all battery operated again. You don't want them wired in because if you go, if you have an electrical out outage, you're not gonna get water. So, uh, and then, Perfect. thank you. Yeah, and now Meeks makes up a, a series of very small sinks because sometimes you need a sink and you only have 11 inches to get a sink in. So I, there's a, a photograph of that sink in this presentation. Thank you. Okay, I guess it's mine. So, you know, again, the idea that every bathroom should have the right size child height sink, and uh, this is the, the American Standard Baby Devereaux uh, that uh, we've used a lot. Uh, it's, it fits the children as young as toddlers up. Um, many bathrooms I go to still um, have, um, often they'll have two toilets and one will be a uh, adult height toilet for I'm not sure what reason, uh, but having adult having a child height sink, as you can see, this is a you know two year old and uh, toilets available in the bathroom. So here's an actually is the example of uh, many where there's uh, it's a building with stalls in it. It's uh, typically modular buildings. I've seen many of them in my travels, just even in the last year like a, a toilet that's more adult height as opposed to child height, a sink that you can kind of see on the, uh, has the step stool because it's not the right height for children. But this is an easy fix uh, as an example, removing the stalls, 
replacing the adult height sink with child height sink, lowering the, uh, the, the child sink to the right height, uh, just opens it up and also may potentially, in terms of supervision, uh, doing a cutout uh, of, on the wall the, from the classroom into the bathroom to allow teachers to easily uh, supervise children if preschoolers who are self-toileting um, in, in the bathroom without having to go in the bathroom. Okay, Kathy on. Heather, Heather, has this been a problem in any of your centers, the noise or has been a problem? Oh, definitely. Uh, one of our sites right now has construction outside of it. And, you know, some the noise can be really loud. And, you know, we try and alert people to nap time, but uh, it, it can be disruptive. Yeah. So one thing I think that is often overlooked in facilities is acoustic health. Especially, I don't think most people know, but a child's um, auditory and system and their, their understanding of speech doesn't fully develop until they're in their late teens, their late adolescence. So, you know, all that time when, you know, your teenagers go, I can't, what did you say? <laughs> they may not have been able to hear you, but that's even more important because the younger the children, the, you know, the greater the impact on noise there is. And noise can affect developing relationships and communication. And this is why I chose this photograph is because if you had a very noisy, crowded room, this interaction from these two children, one in a helping a toddler, helping another one, <laughs> you know, do their shoes, tie their shoes. But it never happened if there's a lot of noise because you wouldn't be able to focus. Next slide. And so uh, another one is um, this is, you know, the most important thing is always group size and room size, but sometimes we can't do anything with that. But, you know, the cr more crowded the space, the noisier it's going to become, the smaller the space and the noisier it may be if you have a large group of children. But a, a huge space with a little bit of children could be a problem also. So we have um, the the classroom on the left has acoustic tiles. They have a mix of area rugs. They have upholstered furniture, et cetera, to help absorb with noise. And the classroom on the right has such tall ceilings that the acoustics are just going to bounce off everywhere. And they have hard surfaces. They don't have any area rugs. They don't have any window coverings even to absorb some noise. And it looks that that is a tile wall above the wainscoting. So that's even more um, non-noise absorbing surface. Next screen. So basically, if you have very old acoustic tiles, they most likely don't work anymore, a contractor had told me. And, and so you may want to think about replacing them. And, and be careful if you are in a building that was built before 1985, they probably have asbestos in them. And therefore, you need to get a special uh, remediation person to look at those. But if you're buying new ones, there is uh, make sure you have that uh, noise reduction coefficient at the right one. You can also try to quiet exterior systems like HVACs, lights, appliances, or replace those. A lot of lights, old fluorescent lights are noisy. They could be replaced with new efficient LED ones. And you think of um, uh, doing different kinds of surfaces, wall panels, and area rugs. But you can see how um, noise bounces off a hard area, it absorbs, it makes it smaller, but diffusion, you know, it does go in different directions and makes it quieter in the classroom.
Okay, I was going to sort of ask you a question, Heather, about your teachers and having things within the classroom. Yeah, I mean, so many of our spaces weren't built for our teachers, and they were barely built for our students. Uh, to have a really organized space for all of our teachers is um, would be so helpful for them. It, this is a great use of the grant. Yeah. So this is a classroom, and within the classroom, they have a space where there's a, a teacher support area for teacher prep. And as you can see in the inside, they have a sink, a dishwasher, and it looks like a slide and range on one side for food prep. On the other side, it's for materials for admin, you know, et cetera. It's like they have a little refrigerator in here. And I think this is all because um, they have a gate right here, so the children don't have access to it, especially if there's a range in the classroom. But it sure makes a difference. Plus, that here, this is a, a cutout where the um, between the upper cabs and the counter, yeah, you could see through. So you have good visibility into the classroom from there. So, you know, you're in there, you should just be able to look up and to be able to take a quick scan of the room to do observation and, and help with supervision. And here is another one that's self-contained. And again, it is so important that teachers, it adds some professionalism for them to have everything in one place. They don't have to get up and leave the classroom to um, go get things in the refrigerator or put things in the dishwasher or send an email or make a printout of something, look at the children's, um, you know, files, etc. In some classrooms, you're not able to have a self-contained unit where you have a half door or a gate entryway. But this is a, a very viable option for a lot of classrooms is to put in upper and lower cabinets that have a sink within them. You could even, if they had the plumbing for it, you could even get a dishwasher in there if the plumbing was correct. But this, it, you're able to, you know, as Lewis talked before about not only children having hand washing, but the adults have it so handy. Uh, it's, it's just a real lifesaver when you talk to staff. Next slide. Oh, okay. I was going to do this. Yeah, so, you could do it. <laughs> um, so this presentation is really on sort of more of the nuts and bolts as opposed to like furniture space planning. But it, as Kathy was saying, a teacher support area, whether it can the room is large enough that you could have a self-contained space or at least a counter space is uh, important. Uh, but then through the science of space planning, um, you can actually make the same room 25, 30% bigger. This is so amazing to, uh, uh, to do. And I've worked on the many, many hundreds of those. But one of the key elements of creating a well-organized environment is having storage adjacent to each activity area. Right, so many programs I'll go in and the classrooms are filled with shelves all along the wall on the, on the floor, some of them more for storage as opposed to uh, children's use. Um, how to increase the amount of usable space in the classroom? Uh, take advantage of the walls and have wall storage for your reading areas, for your block areas, for your eating and table areas, for your dramatic play areas right above those activity areas. That will also warm, uh, provide a sort of a warmth to the space and it also will help with uh, acoustics. Uh, okay. And Kathy, you go now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this is my favorite wall cabinet. If I made a Kathy's favorite things list, this would head it because it is the wall cabinet that, that you can use just above the activity. So on the top, the the doors slide back and forth so you can have storage in there the bottom shelf you can have 
uh, put things that you can readily have access to. Plus it has a little lip for California and our earthquake and shaking. And so it's available at Discount School Supply. It's uh, one of their environments um, uh, lined and it's called wall storage. They also have other kind of storage cabinets you have, they have, and also Community Play Things has them that are for more adult storage that look like kitchen cabinets. And then the other opportunity is, and I don't have pictures of them and I don't know why, is so often, you know, you have classroom storage for the things you use and then you have outside classroom. And usually the outside classroom storage closet, it's like a hazard. <laughs> there's things you trip over, there's so much stuff, you don't know what you have. You know, there could be vermin in there, pests, and you know. so another thing is to get it organized. Get some shelving, either if it's built-in shelving or those um, wire shelving, and get the right kind of containers that you can, you know, you're able to see what's in them and have them labeled correctly because that is so important. Uh, I'm, I remember redoing a center, we were cleaning out a closet and I was going, do you know how much red paint you have? <laughs> they had gallons and gallons because I couldn't see where, where it was. Oh, and full wall storage. This is another thing, do not, if you can at all possible, do not take a full wall and put storage on it as you see these two darker doors are. First of all, it took a valuable floor space. You can't have activities along the perimeter, which is where you want to put children's activities. And it made this entire space in front, Morris, can you show? It wound up being circulation rather than play space. Plus, you can't see on the other side of the climber. See, there is no supervision. And it would have been perfect to have that climber put in the corner, that loft, but you can't because guess what? They have another set of doors, <laughs> storage there. So this is what not to do because you can't see behind this and this becomes a very uh, difficult place to supervise. Next slide. Okay, how many of you are have um, shadows in your classrooms? I, I remember going into one center and I looked at the reading area and there was so dark. I don't understand how children could read in there. So make sure that your center is well lit and it has something um, that you know, and that's not only from electrical lighting, which is a little easier to fix than putting in windows sometimes, but you do want to mix. You know, generally it's preferred to have more natural light, the major way to light a classroom, like you see the classroom on the left, it doesn't have its lights on and it has plenty of light. The middle picture is the same classroom with the lights on. And this classroom has extremely low ceilings. And I just wanted to show you that you can find light fixtures that are very thin, that hug the wall ceiling that can be mounted that work. We typically like to vary lighting in uh, classrooms and throughout the center to have it more home-like quality. So ones that are like task lighting, you can see there's task lighting below the cabinets back there you know, and the teacher support area, et cetera. And this other one, and, and, and windows. So we can't uh, say enough about having windows to let in the natural light and operable windows. We can get to that in ventilation, but if you're putting windows then you need to have op uh, operational windows. All classrooms should have windows. It worries me when they don't. But again, you see in the picture to the right, you have pendant lighting, and then you have in ceiling lighting. And Kathy, see, how hard is it to change out the lighting? It depends. It depends on what kind of ceiling you have. So if you have a dropped in ceiling, pretty easy. You know, that's an easy one to do. If you're back to the, the, uh, photograph on the 
uh, left hand side to do yeah to do put in those lights they probably had one or two lights but it isn't that difficult because what you wind up doing is the electrician just pulls wire to, to that and then he puts in a junction box he has to open up the ceiling put a junction box maybe the wire is over and then they have to repatch up the drywall so it is a little bit more extensive than just replacing pendant lights or replacing land lights. I think on the picture on the right, those are actually suspended lights. Yeah. yeah. And what about windows? Can we use this uh, grant to add windows and take out walls? I, oh, I, am, I, I think interior walls. I don't think exterior walls, but... I think replacing windows and making sure they're operable is a certain, is an excellent way to use uh, funding of any type. And I'm pretty sure, I mean, I read over the guidelines. I'm not specifically sure we're supposed to, you know, talk specifically to DSS about that. But I think replacing the windows so they're operable, replacing the um, window coverings, because you also want to be able to control light and glare. So if you have, you can put roller shades in. Some of them now have auto controls if you have real high windows, um, which often happens when you're doing space um, readaptive use, like you're taking an old building and they have you know, office high windows to be able to close and shut the windows, the, the sun. So that's something to look into also. And make sure that they're dimmable and multi-level switching. I don't know if you know what that means, but it's a requirement of the Department of the State Department of the Architect has in California. Is you have to have you have to have um, the ability to have fifty percent of the lights off and fifty percent of the lights on. So, so you did. It's not that you have to keep them all on or off, but you have the ability to do that. Can you see it? Oh, and again, task lighting, um, full light with doors with full visibility panels. Do you see how much light that's bringing in? And let's say there wasn't a window on the other side. I'm pretending there wasn't a window to the um, right of the door. <laughs> And putting one in, look what they, you know, you could do. Or just increasing the size of a window. If you have a small window, is to increase the size of it. And we just come in standard sizes. Yeah. And again, the that's a, I kind of like, because there's airflow, you know, for ventilation, the air, the air in the classroom goes out and you want the fresh air to come in. So there's ventilation and then fresh air flow, which you want to have happen. And in this picture way to the um, left here is the ability, you know, if you're able to get the windows down to child height, which the picture on the right shows so that the kids could actually look out and engage in what's going on outside. Um, you can always bring the children up to the window if you don't have the ability to um, put in low windows. The other thing is also putting in uh, visible, doors with visibility panels in them within the interior doors of the classroom so children can see out You know, when the parents are coming. Also a safety issue that you don't open a door on a child. The other thing that's really nice about some of the new windows is they help with the noise. Yes. yes. Also, this is a good one too. <laughs> a kind of a light paint palette. So the paint reflects light. So centers that have darker colors like dark greens and dark burgundies are deep bright colors. They can, they can be not deep, and dark, but they could be deep and bright. They have just the same problem, is they don't reflect light well. So really, and, and so painting a, with a lighter color that reflects light, it also makes the environment a bit less visually um, 
visually, it's calmer. <laughs> it's more visually calm than when it has so much stuff. Because if you look at the picture, the photograph on the left, just imagine if we had bright colored walls in that photograph, how it would be different. You wouldn't be able to see the activities or the children or what was going on. Next. Okay, ventilation, we almost already talked about this. Um, you know, operable windows, ceiling fans are a good option. Because basically, you know, we all learned this in COVID and we've been hearing about it and reading about it. It is, um, what you want to do is disperse uh, the particulates. So there's a ventilation, you got to put it out, push it out through a window or through actually ventilation fans. You want fresh air to be able to come in. And um, you would want, if you have an HVAC system, I don't know if everybody knows what HVAC stands for. That's heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. So if you, and they have usually an air cleaning, they can have air cleaning at your air filters and they can disinfect, but you want to make sure that also has, we have a fresh air mix in that. Next slide. So at HVAC, I am suggesting everybody get a certified inspector to look at your, excuse me. Bless you, Kathy. Yeah, <laughs> to look at your, um, to look at your uh, heating system and make recommendations. You wanna make sure it's the correct capacity for the room, the classroom, or for the entire center. You want it to be quiet. You want it to be able to have what's recommended by uh, the CDC is six air exchanges per hour, but that's using also these MERV filters. So there's a MERV filter if you have a never seen one. <laughs> It's just the highest grade filter you can put in an HVAC system. And you do want the controls uh, in the classroom so you can adjust them. Okay, Th these are all kind of air quality issues too. Um, it's carpeting isn't recommended because of it holds, can hold so much mold and mildew plus it can't be, it's not as easy to clean. It's not waterproof. <laughs> and so what I know I recommend and Lewis recommends is, is um, at least in preschool rooms is to have a water resistant or a waterproof flooring. So one of the um, a very good material that's a very sustainable one is linoleum, old fashioned linoleum. It's actually made out of linseed. It, there's two companies that make it, Marmoleum and Armstrong. Both of them make it in a wide variety of colors. Those are those two kind of orange colored strips uh, in, in the slide. The other thing is LVT, which is luxury vinyl tile which is most likely the flooring that that person is putting that carpet tile on, but it's to the left corner here. Now, the, the one that I like the most of this luxury vinyl tile is Cortec. And the reason is, is because it has such a thick wear layer on the top. So you could go to, you could go to, um, Home Depot, and you can pick up one of their <laughs> samples, and it's so thin, it's so skinny, it's not even an eighth of an inch, if that, versus a good half an inch to, to longer. Plus, it has a, an, a backing on it, which is extremely good, especially if you're putting it over a, a, a concrete flooring, or even if it's a wood flooring. Okay, moisture and dew leaks, um, you know, get those fixed, get the roof inspected. Uh, you know, all of these things can uh, be done with this grant money. 
Okay, I'm going to uh, have a uh, discuss the outdoors for a bit. So again, one of the you know uh, D what DSS guidance and uh, national guidance has been being outside is better and safer and healthier than being inside. We know that we knew it before COVID, and we should be practicing that th uh, after COVID. So in terms of improving facilities, if there's any way, uh, if if you do not have it yet to have direct access from every classroom to the outdoors. So sometimes when I visit sites, some classrooms may have direct access, others have to go down the hallway and around. Uh, it might be possible to do a, a, a cut out a window and make it a, and have direct access. Other times uh, the, the play yards on the opposite side of where the classroom is, but there's some buffer space that's part of their property where you could go out, you know, change a window to a door and have and fence in an area that might only be 10 feet or 12 feet, but it provides that sort of patio space, a little courtyard space that will change your life, both as a teacher and for, for the children to ha have that space as well as expanding the usual uh, the usable space of the classroom is like everything you do inside can happen outside such as eating and table activities All right so housekeeping reading um, block building all of these things is you could have as an extension uh, from the classroom and uh, to with the goal of spending more time outside again why be inside when you can be outside eating doing table activities or building with, with blocks uh, or so on or doing housekeeping so this is a really a critical piece in terms of looking at your space and seeing if, if you don't have that what's possible in terms of having either direct access to the play yard or creating a little patio space uh, on your property, if you have that grassy area on the side of the classroom that you could enclose and make it uh, a little courtyard area. So again, these themes of going directly out, always having a sink. So if you have a sink outside, you have a classroom potentially. And again, the sinks would vary. I think the next slide shows that. But these children uh, from this photo were eating in this very dark classroom and uh, um, not very pleasant. And then now nine, 10 months a year, basically, that's where they have uh, snack, lunch, and also do table activities because there's adjacent storage um, at the covered area. All right, again, there's different, diff there's not one way to do it, but the key is classroom to outdoors, uh, eating table activities, child sink, adult sink, storage, and then the, uh, the play yard activities, the traditional outdoor experiences, and also the extension of the classroom in terms of building and reading and dramatic play. So examples, infant toddler uh, sink, this is actually, and this might be considered depending on where you are, uh, outdoor diaper changing table. Because when children, uh, if one child needs to be changed and that teacher leaves and goes back into the classroom, they leave the other teacher uh, with the ch children under supervised because one is with one inside and the other one is outside with the larger group. So this idea of child sink, adult sink, um, again, and child sink, adult sink adjacent to the classroom or the outdoor area. Shade. So again, depending on what part of the country you're in and what time of year, having shade in areas that ideally is flexible shade, unless it's you're in you know the, the really hot areas of, of California, Southern, where you'd have more extensive permanent shade. There's a company called uh, Coolaroo with a C that has, sells a lot of shade products. I mean, there are others. Uh, but they have some uh, really high quality products, not just shade covering, but also roller shades, because sometimes the sun is coming on the side, not a, from above. So if you go to that website, you could see different options. And, you know, uh, the play yard I see from the, the uh, grant uh, addresses landscaping. 
Um, thinking about many programs have uh, minimal or very compromised sand play areas. The, the play value and learning value of sand is unlimited. And to have a rich sand area for, you know, for building, for language, for social learning, it just goes on and on. And uh, they're engaged throughout the day. So there's different ways to do it. Um, but having th these kinds of experiences outside lend themselves then to spending more time outside because it's not the children aren't only going on trikes and running around. The other uh, surfacing issue, and this relates also to California and our drought, is uh, artificial turf is one option. Um, excuse me. Um, so this this uh, facility actually was originally uh, put uh, grass in. That was you know in the twenty five years ago. The grass didn't hold up. It became a management issue. So when they had the funding, the director installed. Uh, this is field turf. There's different companies. That's a that's a good one. But it just expands the volume that you have uh, in terms of a play space. Also, anything over 18 inches high, any structure, like an example of this flexible uh, geodome, um, is required to have an appropriately resilient surface and uh, for children under two, at least three feet all around, for children over two, uh, six feet. So grass is not a resilient surface. Uh, if this was grass, it wouldn't meet that criteria. Uh, typically field turf uh, meets a uh, fall uh, requirement for up to three foot height, but they you can create uh, uh, for a higher, for a structure, for example, they can put padding underneath to provide the appropriate resiliency for whatever the structure is, if it's four feet or five feet high. So that's some, maybe something to consider uh, as part of uh, your grant application. Here's an example. I visit many programs and just try to do simple uh, provide reports for, for possible improvements. So this was a, a, a topless space where the children came outside. This actually is in the, 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 the south, uh, uh, not, not on the east coast. It's on the, uh, not on the west coast, it's on the east coast in the south. And so very hot and so they come out and they have no sun or rain protection and no hand washing sinks. So it's just basically sort of running about. So this change as an example where is suggesting to putting a hard surface here so that they can have eating table activities of, in this case for toddlers, push and pull toys, simple wheel toys, a reading nook. So having a shade or a, a fixed roof or shade is what I've suggested there. So you might wanna look at that in terms of your outdoor areas is how can you, what do you need in terms of the building wise, facility wise to uh, extend the outdoor learning and extend the time children are outside. And storage is another thing. There's a range of different storage options, larger ones and then smaller ones. Okay, Kathy? Yeah. I I just wanted to um, briefly talk about this because this is also a way to get a teacher support area outside. They now make indoor outdoor cabinetry. So you could have upper cabs along a wall if that's available and you could have lower cabs. Not that I want you to have this bar sink set up there, <laughs> but you can have a teacher sink and you could drop it down to have a child height sink. So, and the picture on the right just shows there's different types of doors and materials and countertops. So these are available in, in, in a, at Home Depot, at Lowe's, et cetera. Also, just a quick thing on safety and looking at our time here, probably, you know, go, go around, do a safety check, look at that checklist. You could go through the things there. The only thing I really want to talk to you about is finger safe. It's a hinge guard. Uh, other companies make them. Um, I, I don't know. We've been using finger safe. <laughs> I don't know who else makes them, but you cannot put your finger in either side of the door. It just doesn't let it happen. 
so it stops pinch fingers. Okay. And okay, so this is oh my goodness, there's so much we could do, right? Well, you know, just get everything together. Um, everything, I guess this this slide is talking about um, everything about applying for regret. Everything we talked about relates to health and safety. So every little thing we talked about, that's a, that is a reason. I want you to be able to think about when you're looking at prioritizing, look at the things that are most urgent. Do you have broken things or you have licensing issues? What's hazardous? Is this, you know, the door doesn't work or when do you board it up? And when I make a decision or when I help recommend, I kind of look at, especially with this money that's available, is to look at what will have the longest term impact, like putting in the sinks, putting in teacher support areas, uh, redoing your flooring, putting in windows, putting in the uh, door to, to have access to um, your outdoor yards, uh, looking at your lighting. So again, it's easy just to get appliances, but look for the longer term impact because it really makes um, learning better for children and and um, and <laughs> and easier for teachers to teach. Sorry, I was reading a, a chat message. So in material selection, um, you know, make sure it's correct for the function. Just because it looks nice <laughs> doesn't mean it's actually going to function how you want it to. So have some criteria. Make sure it's well designed. I will take durability and a long life life cycle. Like if I'm going to buy some cabinetry or some shelving that's that's made well and maybe cost fifty dollars more now or 75 but it's going to last me for 30 40 years that's the one i'm going to look you can also see if they're non-toxic there's a lot of non-toxic non-toxic and sustainable items out there and also look at the um uh the warranties like some of the okay so i just you're going to have to get cost estimates that you're on the phone and taking screenshots for products. And I just want you to make sure that when you get estimates and using contractors, make sure they're bidding on the same exact thing. It's it's not put redo the fence and a gate. And then another one is redo the gate redo the fence and put alarms and make sure they're all bidding on the same scope of work you have. Next one. And then the next thing to do is to prioritize them, kind of put them into three buckets. You do this anyway, I'm sure, about, you know, what's most important, you know, what's okay, this would be good, and then, you know, this will do later. And then I say, uh, okay, Get together with your staff and discuss it, but this is for Q and A. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is awesome. So let's see here. Uh, we are now moving to our Q and A uh, session. Let's um, have everybody. Eileen um, and Pamela join us on the screen. And if you can stop sharing the slides, um, I think it's Kathy that's sharing the slides, right? I'm good. That'd be I'll great. Stop yeah. Yeah. So, um, and then, okay. So, Eileen, what did we, uh, what questions came up in the uh, QA? Well, Pamela and I have been gathering them and we sort of grouped them by topic area. So we thought that might be better rather than bouncing around. So the first set of questions was about sinks and plumbing. And I, I missed this if you talked about it, but did you talk about the correct height for infant toddler versus preschool classroom sinks? That was yeah, one question. We, we did it and it's a good question. Yeah. So again, it depends on the age grouping in the classroom. So if, for example, if it was an infant room and infants meaning uh, no more than up to 15 to 18 months, 
uh, the height would be uh, probably uh, like 18 inches. And then sometimes if it's a younger group, if it's up to like 12 or 13, it might be 16. But basically, you know, it's, the, it's that range. Uh, if it's a toddler group, an 18 month old uh, up, uh, 21 inches can work well. Uh, if it's a two year old group, 22 inches. If it's a preschool room, 24 inches works really well. But the, uh, the other key, uh, unless it's a trough sink at those heights, is the cabinetry that it's in. So uh, Kathy mentioned about the faucet handles uh, set so that child so that they can more easily reach that. Also to have a, a, the, um, the sink itself be more towards the front of the cabinet. These are very important because you can have the right height and have a problem where children have to overreach, the water goes down their, their uh, arm and onto the floor. So the, it's the height and the, the reach of it um, that, that's really important. Um, I, I have to tell a little story about that. I, in one of the centers, that was a, a very beautiful center. I worked a lot, or very hard on it, but the outdoor child sink was, they made it for elementary school. <laughs> and the architect and contractor were going, like, that's wrong, that's wrong. And they go, why? And I go, because the kids, are good. they can't reach it. They're going to get up there. They're going to do it. The water's going to go down the arm. It's going to, and then sure enough, a child did that right in front of them. <laughs> so yeah. it, it's not correct. And to make sure that the sinks are installed as close as to the leading edge as possible. Because yeah. most people put them back and run them forward. I, I also want to mention, because I have it in my shelf here, I bring it when I go to classrooms. It's for folks that don't know about these faucet extenders. So if you go on like Amazon or whatever, and you see uh, child faucet extenders where you're not able to change the, the faucet uh, and you can make a sink that's uh, not easily reachable, at least from some of the children, reachable. So these are like, you know, $7 each. So I always bring them when I go to my cl uh, classrooms as a sort of short, short term or long term, depending on the situation option. It's worth testing it. You know, so, okay. Okay. Um, I, I could see we could do this for hours and hours. But um, so the next question is, do sinks count in the square footage usable space when licensing a licensing analyst measures the classroom space? It, it's not part of the usable space. It's taken against the usable space as well as any built-in cabinets, um, you know, nap room areas. And unfortunately, see, this is the issue is that there's a big difference between licensing standards and quality standards. Licensing standards definition is minimum standards beyond which care is considered unsafe. And frankly, there are many standards that create unsafe environments for, for children. You know, I had, I was a preschool teacher with 32 preschoolers in my classroom one year, an infant toddler teacher with 16 children, because California does not have a group size limitation. The general agreement, and this is true for both learning and emotional health and physical health. That's why the American Academy of Pediatrics says, you know, it should never be less than 50 square feet of usable space. And actually the recommendation is much higher than that. They might say 42 square feet of usable space, but they discount all the things that we would count or licensor would count, like the entry area where the cubbies are or the walkway areas. These are just activity areas. So any way that you can increase the amount of space if you're setting up a classroom, never less than 50, but really going more to 70, the, the science of space planning can make rooms bigger than they function and extending the classroom to the outdoors. So when you say, oh, that sounds good, but I can't do that right now. Um, those are ways space planning and um, extension uh, to the outdoors will increase your learning environment size. So, so going back to answer that question, does it count for licensing? I have to say in my experience of working with providers, getting centers licensed, it depends on the licensing person. Yeah. So, so it's not this practice, but it depends, you know. Yeah. But it doesn't. I mean, it's it, it specifically, it does not. So you might have a licensor that's more flexible, even though they shouldn't mm -hmm. be. And then the next licensor says that's you're out of compliance. Mm -hmm. But uh, so, yeah, 
hopefully you have a lot more uh, than 35 square feet per child. Mm -hmm. it's, it's an insane uh, square footage per child uh, uh, allotment that we provide in many, many programs in many states. Lewis, because what else don't they cut and take out? I mean, that's what I typically do is I take out circulation, take out the restrooms. Right. Well, the circulation, they won't. I mean, that's more best practice. So certainly okay. the, the restrooms, the nap rooms, the built-in cabinetry, the, the yeah. base cabinets, all of that will be ex uh, deleted from the usable square footage. But let's... Ideally, we, we try to say, how can we move to more best practice, recognizing that there's always compromises, you know, that's, that's also the reality. Yeah, isn't that you always say best practices is where we should start? <laughs> Cutting point, uh, not the destination. The destination is more than we thought about right now. So, you know, best practices 20 years ago was not the best practices we have, we know now. So that's, we should always be striving for that because what are we doing? It's like, it's not a holding tank. It's like we're caring for children and we're trying to support an opti optimal learning experience and a healthy experience. So this is where it is. The smaller the room, the larger the group size, the higher the incidence of upper respiratory illnesses and, and actually ear infections. And that's part of why American Academy of Pediatrics initially said, you know, we need to have bigger rooms. And that's why with the COVID guidelines, they minimize room, the group size, right? Because we know these things and this is how we should be working towards. But again, in the interim, if you're a director and you're trying to manage the program, what do I do right now? You know, the sculpting of the environment, efficiency and the extension to the outdoors will get the biggest bang for your buck in terms of improving the learning environment and the healthy health environment for children and, and staff. So Pamela, do you have any questions you want to highlight or comments? Sure. Um, we see here in the chat, I'm gonna move it over to questions about lighting and the environment. So um, we were asked, what your thoughts are on sky tunnels. They're like skylights, but smaller and add natural light. Oh, the little light tunnel thing. Oh, they're wonderful. The ones that come through the roof and they daylight, they are absolutely wonderful. I haven't put them in any centers because usually my centers aren't freestanding. So <laughs> there's something on top of them. So you don't have that ability, but um, I have, um, friends of mine who have them in their home and they're just wonderful they called like solar tubes or something like that yeah, yeah. it's new it wasn't it, they're like been out for about seven years they've improved them so much than mm. the ones from 20 years ago mm. they're wonderful and and um on the same topic do you have any suggestions uh of lighting for low ceiling spaces with low ceilings i you mean specific uh, fixtures? No, you would have to go look for that. In fact, I would go to a lighting store, not a retail store, but the ones that the electrician goes to when you go in there and you ask them because <laughs> they will have, um, they'll have options because they know. Um, and this question was asked if there is a wall can it be uh, replaced with um, a window or can some of it be replaced with a window to add more natural lighting? Of course. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you just basically have to, you know, have contractors in and, or an architects, depending on the, how extensive it is and just see what's, you know, what's doable. What, you know, you can identify what you would like and is that a structural wall as opposed to, you know, not, that makes a big difference, but it's all possible either way. Uh, uh -huh. So I, I think kind of starting with, you know, appropriate practice and then seeing what's feasible given the funds that are available and just prioritizing what Kathy had said in, uh, earlier. Yeah, um, you can go to, you know, there are lumber yards. Typically, there are lumber yards that specializes in windows and doors, correct, around California. So I would go to one of those and talk with them because they'll carry different types of doors, different types of windows, and they can, you know, help you with that. So if it's just, I don't know if you will, do you need a permit to put in a door, Lewis? I, 
I don't, you know, it, I don't know how it works with this funding, but I can tell you I'm working with a family child care program in LA where they had an infant room separate from the, from the rest of the group, very small room. Uh, they have a window and they had a side yard. So that was my recommendation yeah. and that's what they're going to do. They could cut, do the window cut out, put a sliding door, which is also important yeah. for emergency exiting. It's very important. Uh, and that's going to, and then you develop the yard uh, so that it's in a, a bigger classroom, learning environment. Yes. Yeah. So that, that will change everything, that, that one uh, improvement. Oh. In addition to the sinks outside right. you know, and shade. Yeah. yeah, natural light really does. I mean, we saw those differences in your slides that you showed. They're just amazing how it went from one type of environment to such a such a, a nurturing learning environment. And not only nurturing for the children, but also for the teachers. I know when I was teaching, it was so hard to be in an environment that was so cluttered and like you say, what do you say? Compromised in general, mm -hmm. is that it's so tiring at the end of the day. And that's something that I know staff really appreciates when they get to work in some place that's designed uh, not only for the kids, but with them in mind, you know, it holds them as being more professional and it helps them get through the day also. So talking about lighting and um, also, you can remind me also, um, any remarks, any insights about inclusive environments for kids with special needs, including with autism, right? And um, ADA compliance, like perhaps like insights about the environments that are inclusive. I know they touched on all the topics that we talk about, but any insights yeah. about that? Well, with ADA, it mainly comes in, uh, what we've talked about would be the sinks and the toilets. And the toilets is just <laughs> go into the whole grab bar issue. Do you need grab bars above them or not? Can you use a baby Devro toilet because the tank's too tall? But um, they do not, you know, if children are under four or under, they do not need to have grab bars around the toilet. And if you put them in, the heights that are listed and the state department of the architect are just that they're just suggested and i have spoken with many people at uh dsa about this so that's one the other one is is handles i think the lever handles are very important because um your hardware is uh, is all levered now you don't have doorknobs you know, you may want to replace your hardware with the ones with levers because they're easier to grab and being able to access the sinks. I mean, it's having ramps for outdoor, that's building code for every inch you go up, you need a foot of out on a slope. So if you have a 12 inch <laughs> foot thing, you need 12 feet of, of slope, which eats up a lot of yard. So you have to think of how tall you can make those. Mm -hmm. But Lewis, for yeah. inclusion, ADA for the kids? Right. Well, I'm thinking more of like just sort of appropriate practice for children that, you know, the children with special needs are children first. And so depending on what their need is, they may or may not need an adaptation, right? So uh, good practice and as child development is you're meeting individual needs. So if the child needs a, a piece of adaptive equipment, then that that plays into it, but a child with a you know a motor delay or or, or even a speech delay isn't going to need anything necessarily different. A child who uh, motorically is, has to say they have cerebral palsy and they're old, but motorically they're functioning more like a fourteen month old or fifteen month old. Equipment should, you know should be provided that meets their their uh, uh, ability, their individual ability. Yeah. Um, Heather, maybe do you have any insights about this topic that is that you apply in your centers? Um, for example, there was a question about colors, right, on the walls, like how to paint your uh, center with bright colors or natural colors. When we think about kids with uh, autism, for example, we know that colors is stimulating as well as lightning. lighting. Um, so any insights about that, what you apply in your center and what's the best practices? 
Well, I think that, you know, for children with special needs, the need to be flexible is key. And, you know, to look at a site with a new child coming in and have an idea of their experience. Um, the colors on the walls are also important. You know, everything that goes into it, the outside noise, uh, you know, we really take care in our fire procedures and things like that to make sure that we are um, thinking of the children's needs and how they're going to react to something like loud noises. But flexibility is really the key there and then approaching it from the child's point of view. Thank you. Any additional questions, Eileen, that you see um, coming up? Yeah, can I ask one? Oh, uh, Pamela, go ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we saw that um, this, when thinking about maybe larger renovation projects, um, for centers that are open year round, um, how or what tips do you have for getting construction done while still operating? You know, that's always a challenge uh, and it just depends on the project. That example I showed you of the infant, uh, the, uh, the diapering changing tape area where we did a window cut out and um, they, they were really flexible and they worked on weekends and, and nights. Uh, it's easier, you know, usually out of the city that you can get uh, contractors that are willing to do that than like in you know, a San Francisco or LA. But yeah, each, each project is, is different. Some have relocated uh, for a period of time. Others, you know, some programs do shut down for a couple of weeks and then they work around the other times. So it just really depends on the extent of the project uh, of what, what's feasible, yeah. I'll just add to that. We operate a year round program and we have been very fortunate to work with contractors who are very sensitive to the children's needs and will work around our schedule. Uh, it takes some effort to find those contractors. Some have come from our parents um, and that's been really important. The other thing is we do shut down between December 24th and January 1st. And that is a huge time for us to do a lot of renovation. Sometimes we'll close a few days on the ends there if it's going to be significant. But it definitely is a challenge when you're operating all the days. Other questions? As we close, we have one minute more or two. Um, we got a question in the chat asking if any of the panelists are available to consult. <laughs> you mean for this? Yeah, we are consultants, <laughs> but I, I usually do huge projects or, <laughs> you know, so it's kind of, that's kind of hard because the consulting, yes, I'm a consultant. I work with programs. It just depends what it is and if it fits mm -hmm. within a schedule that I have. We will share the contact information uh, as allowed by with everyone. And then one thing that we are going to be doing as Build Up California is compiling a list of consultants in this area, including also architects and um, contractors in, according to the region, right? Oh. Um, so that's something that we will be doing the upcoming weeks and months. Uh, not sure if whether it will be we will have many resource listed for this state grant now for this uh, round, but one thing is to apply and the other thing is to implement the project. So we will have a list on our website. Kathy? I just wanna say, I can't, I can't really um, do consulting for the state oh, yeah, yeah. funding because okay. I'm, uh -huh. I'm a yeah, reader. You're part of, yeah, yeah. <laughs> a reviewer you're part of the, the team. That's right. That's right. That's so, right. So that will work. Yeah. So. Okay. So any final thoughts, remarks, insights, Louise, Louise and Heather? Let's start with Louise. Like any final remarks uh, that you want to share? Any final thoughts? Well, I just would say, you know, this has been my, my main focus of my work for 43 years, starting as a teacher, because I realized that the environment was compromising what I was doing, that if I was on, even though I had great training, uh, if I was honest with myself, I was many times being a policeman or having to be a magician because the environment wasn't engaging. Mm -hmm. uh, children were doing lots of aimless wandering. Uh, some of that was, you know, 
the group size, some of that with plumbing. So these things really make a difference. So for me, when I do my teacher training, that's, that's as, as important as su uh, supporting children's learning. It's like, how do you support teachers to do the job that is, if as administrators, we want our staff to do. Mm -hmm. So I think investing in this uh, reaps, you know, incredible dividends on all levels, learning, development, stress, and physical health, emotional health. So mm -hmm. it's a good thing to, to be thinking about, not just with the, the funding that we have now, but as part of your, at your program planning, your master mm -hmm. plan of your program, um, not, you know, including extending, making rooms bigger or as group size smaller. So just having a plan that one funding or other resources. Sometimes it's not money is only one resource. Like uh, Kathy said, or, or you know, parents can do certain things, or you can have other uh, folks in the community. So just if you if you're committed to it, there's a way to figure it out. <laughs> That's perfect way to close. That's awesome. Thank you so much to uh, all of you that uh, took the time of your day to be here with us uh, as speakers, as facilitators, as support uh, team, but also as attendees. Uh, as again, we will be sharing uh, the questions that were not answered. We are going to share with Kathy and with the team, we too. And we will have a list of uh, FAQ like on our website, Build Up California website. So uh, stay tuned for the follow-up email and then for future events. Um, and we will have another one of these uh, webinars like um, for family childcare provider on Saturday, 10 to 11.30, please um, sign up for it on our website. And uh, with that, um, I will close the event and take care of everybody and see you soon.